Good afternoon. It's Friday the 5th of June 2020, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me in the studio today, Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire. Welcome to the programme, Patrick. Great to be with you, Mike. Uh, right. Well, we'll get, uh, we'll get straight on with this, uh, Patrick. The, uh, the Global Vaccine Summit 2020 took place uh, in London yesterday. Uh, well, or it didn't, because, of course, it was virtual. Uh, there was no uh, real, there were no real people there, you might argue. Uh, it was hosted by Boris Johnson. He opened it and closed it. Uh, and, uh, well, I have to say it was the most egregious piece of propaganda I think I've ever seen. Uh, we'll come to that in a second. So it was aiming to raise $7.4 billion for Gavi, which is the Vaccine Alliance. Uh, and uh, as I say, it was opened by Boris. And he said, I hope this summit will be the moment when the world comes together to unite humanity in the fight against disease. Just as the UK is the single biggest donor to the international effort to build a coronavirus vaccine, uh, we will remain the world's leading donor to Gavi, contributing 1.65 billion pounds over the next five years. Uh, and uh, uh, this was really what this was about. It was about uh, a fundraising drive for Gavi. So, uh, so who was there or who was attending? Uh, well, the great and the good uh, from the United Nations. Donald Trump was uh, there, China represented. Uh, the EU, of course, uh, France and Germany. Uh, they were all there, uh, all making pledges. Uh, India, uh, it goes on. Now, I think the most uh, striking aspect of this summit, Patrick, was that no one was speaking off the cuff. Everybody was reading script. Uh, and literally reading a script. Uh, you'll see that in a second. Um, no ad-libbing allowed. Even Q&A sessions, Patrick, uh, a question was asked and the response that came back was a scripted response. So they obviously had foresight of the, uh, of the questions uh, and gave the answers. Um, so uh, let's, let's have a listen, first of all, to what this was really all about. This is uh, Dr. Uh, Seth uh, Berkeley, who's uh, the CEO of Gavi. Gavi's role is to address market failures in the vaccine market. This happens when market forces don't deliver the best outcome for the public. For instance, in vaccines, you want them to be accessible to those who need them most, but they are not necessarily the ones with the deepest pockets. 20 years ago at Davos, Gavi the Vaccine Alliance was created to solve this precise problem to deliver new and underutilized vaccines in low-income countries to prevent outbreaks, save lives, support economic growth and well-being. How do we do this? We work with countries to make a long-term projection of their needs. The Alliance then engages with the vaccine industry to negotiate volumes at the best price. As we purchase vaccines for more than half of the world's children, we can credibly reassure the vaccine industry that it's worth innovating and investing in production capacity. Um, um, so the first thing you'll notice, of course, he wasn't looking at the camera. No one was looking at the camera because the scripts that they had were off camera. The only person that actually uh, obviously was using a script uh, was was uh, Ms. Merkel. She was being honest. And she helped, had, the, had the piece of paper, paper in her hand. Everybody else reading off a screen to the side of the camera. Uh, but that says it all, Patrick, doesn't it? Uh, what's this really about? Uh, a business model where uh, first world taxpayers uh, put money into an organization. Uh, well, they're basically pumping money directly into the pharmaceutical industry uh, for third, you know, with, with the excuse of, of uh, preventing disease in third world countries. It's a, it's a corp form of corporate welfare, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, subsidizing uh, the likes of GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, well, it's funny you mentioned GlaxoSmithKline because they were absolutely represented. In fact, I think they were the only corporate representation there that I noticed. Uh, I could be wrong on that, uh, but there was uh, one other uh, kind gentleman there, uh, as, as you would expect, and that was Bill Gates. So let's have a listen to what he had to say. As we race to develop a COVID-19 vaccine, we must also renew our commitment to delivering every life-saving vaccine there is to every child on earth. That is the work that Gavi and Alliance partners have been doing for 20 years. And when we come together as a global community to support Gavi replenishment, we're making sure that it can continue to do these things until no child dies from a vaccine preventable disease. So this was about Gavi replenishment. Uh, and uh, as Boris said, they were looking for $7.4 billion. 
Uh, Gates then went on to pledge $1.6 billion. Uh, the UK pledged £1.65 billion. Pounds, uh, and the total amount that they raised was $8.8 .8 billion. Dollars. There's a few disturbing things just in that short segment from Bill Gates, Mike. Um, he's saying that, uh, I believe, is inferring that every child needs a coronavirus vaccine. Uh, and every child on earth, he said, I think he was talking about vaccines in general, but to, to, to push the idea, Mike, that children are at risk of COVID-19 is um, not only disingenuous uh, by Bill Gates, uh, but this is absolutely a fraudulent statement mm. uh, by somebody who's actually running point on uh, vaccine policy. It looks like in the UK, the UK is running point in partnership with Bill Gates, effectively. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, Patrick, uh, Boris Johnson had two or three telephone calls with Bill Gates in the last couple of weeks in the run up to this. So why would you, even if you could develop a vaccine, which there's no guarantee that they will develop a safe and effective vaccine, that's debatable on its own. But even if they did, Mike, why would you want to vaccinate or do a max, mass vaccination campaign for a disease uh, that doesn't affect really 99.73% of the population or is not really at serious risk to it. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Uh, and uh, in fact, children uh, aren't at risk from it at all. Really. Almost non-existent yeah. uh, with children. So why, why aren't people not challenging uh, Bill Gates on this? Why are politicians literally lining up to read off a script handed to them by, by who? Who wrote the script? Was it government? Was it the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? Was it a PR firm uh, in New York City? Who, who wrote the script? This is the question. A uh, very good question. It was entirely scripted. I don't know what the p point of the whole thing was. Uh, they could just as easily have issued a, a press release uh, and 30 seconds <laughs> work would have, uh, would have been all that it required because there was no uh, advantage to running that event whatsoever. Anything that's scripted, last thing I'll say, Mike, is that it shows that they probably don't have a lot of confidence in being able to speak ex extemporaneously mm. on the subject no, or take any questions from the press or anything like that. Right. Was there a Q&A session no. with the press? Of course not. So uh, and no comments allowed below the YouTube video as it was live streamed either. Not surprising. Yeah. Not surprising. Um, right. Well, let's, uh, Patrick, move on to a quarantine. Well, th this is an important story. Uh, there's been a bit of pushback on the UK's policy, Mike. You probably heard about this as well in the last couple of weeks. This idea that any travelers returning to the UK from an overseas trip or anybody visiting the UK from another country would have to go into 14-day uh, quarantine. In other words, they would, as soon as they land, they have to go straight to their hotel or residency and they can't leave and then they would sign up to a kind of a monitoring or surveillance scheme of some description. And one of the side things about this, Patrick, is that uh, you know, you're used to this in the US. When you arrive in the US, you're required to give the, the address that you're staying at as you go into the country. This hasn't been the case in the UK. Now you are required to give an address that you're staying at. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of pushback on this because a lot of businesses are saying, why would, I, why would we want to come to the UK to do business? It doesn't make any practical sense mm -hmm. if you're going to be quarantined. So business leaders are pushing back against the government on this, saying that uh, this is basically going to isolate uh, the UK um, you know, from the world, basically. And so who would want to go to the UK? I've already spoken to some business people, Mike, that had engagements in the continent. They didn't go uh, because they were booked after uh, June the 8th. Mm. So they didn't go because they didn't want to get uh, enmeshed and ensnared in this new medical uh, surveillance system. Um, so there is some pushback there. So I think um, you, how, how's, the, how's this being uh, taken by the, the airline industry? For uh, well, British Airways, in fact, uh, well, according to politics home there, British Airways spurns Pretty Patel call amid row over 14-day coronavirus quarantine plans. This is all over the mainstream press. Uh, basically, uh, they are described as having clashed over plans to quarantine travellers. Uh, the airline refused to meet her. Uh, and uh, the and a government source then said that uh, British Airways was not serious about getting Britain working again. So tensions between BA and uh, the government absolutely escalating because this is seen as an existential threat. Um, in the meantime, the EU pushing back very hard as well. Uh, so they have been talking, certainly France, saying that if the UK is going to implement a 14-day uh, quarantine, then they're going to do the same. Uh, Greece, Turkey, Spain, Portu Portugal, all the countries that are uh, in particular 
financial problems uh, and, and rely on tourism. They're attempting to get uh, corridors, what they're describing as transport corridors set up to get people to the Mediterranean resorts uh, without having to go through some kind of quarantine. Immunity bridges, I think, was a term I saw a few weeks ago. Right. It's a nice uh, so, creative term. So it'll be very interesting to see how this develops. It's very interesting that this is happening now uh, when this pandemic it must be seen as being mainly over. Mainly over. In, in Europe, it is regarded generally as being over. But the problem is, Mike, and I'll, I won't belabor this point, but you know, the United States and Britain are still very influential on the world stage. So any policy they adopt it almost has to uh, be adopted by everybody, or say the Anglosphere, if you mm. will, North America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, mm. Great Britain. So um, if, if they go one way on this policy, then usually Europe and parts of Asia and, and South America, even they're gonna have to kind of go along with it just to kind of keep this kind of uniform governance mm. uh, globally. So this is, this is still important an issue in terms of uh, global policy. Uh, absolutely. Um, in the meantime, then, of course, the government has decided that we must wear face masks if we're going to go on to uh, public transport. Yes, that's right. And here is the, uh, the latest, the latest uh, deacon to grace the pulpit, uh, the uh, safety pulpit there at Downing Street. This is Grant, Grant Shapps. Grant Shapps, he's a new face uh, here, and he's basically saying that uh, face mask coverings will be mandatory on public transport, not just in London, not just on the tube, Mike, but nationwide. So mandatory masks. But of course, you can see they're not using the word mask, Mike, in the headline, and they're calling it coverings or face coverings. So they've, they've come up with a new ubiquitous politically correct term that doesn't seem as um, ghoulish as, uh, as the mask. But uh, here he is uh, giving his um, bullet points. Now, some things were said in this press conference, Mike, that you know, a lot of people are just be, have become um, uh, impervious to some of the things that have been said, but mm -hmm. they are absolutely outright shocking, some of the things when you sort of line them up. So let's look at some bullet points here of, uh, of what he said. So mandatory masks, coverings must be worn on buses, trams, trains, coaches, aircraft, and ferries, okay? So coverings, masks, uh, will be a condition of travel uh, and not wearing one could ultimately lead to a fine. So they're threatening uh, fines for people who don't wear masks or coverings uh, when they're traveling. This is quite a, a, you know, a, a heavy regime that they're trying to impose here. Surgical masks must be kept for clinical settings, he's saying. So travelers should wear homemade coverings, scarves, uh, and bandanas. Okay, so so they're saying don't wear the surgical mask. Those are for the NHS. Uh, we need to stock the PPE, save the NHS. So make up your own mask. Uh, so quite incredible. And uh, it goes on. Say, so he's saying, why wouldn't people want to do the right thing? Oh, we'll come on to that in a second. Says says Grant uh, Shapps there. And so very young children, disabled people, and those with breathing difficulties. Uh, would be exempt. So you can get a waiver uh, for children. So this is strange though. So th there's so much controversy, Mike, about opening the schools and Bill Gates has just told us that children need to be vaccinated to save them against corona, but, but children get a waiver from wearing masks according to this new diktat uh, from the government. Isn't that strange? Uh, absolutely, but uh, the government isn't going far enough. Apparently the British Medical Journal uh, saying that uh, it not, needs to be much broader than this. They're saying the BMA recently advocated the wearing of face coverings by several uh, by, by the public several weeks ago in areas where they cannot socially distance and believes it's right that people should be required to wear face coverings on public transport. But they went on to say masks should not be restricted to public transport, but to all areas where social distancing is not always possible. Uh, so, uh, well, but the problem is that the UK government and other places has said that masks are marginally beneficial as a precautionary measure. So if they're only marginally beneficial, uh, then why would they be being pushed forward quite this hard? And the other thing uh, to, to ask is, has there been a risk assessment either by the British Medical Journal or its advisors or the government? Uh, because, of course, what about hypercapnia? Now, this is... Uh, a excess CO2 being breathed in, which of course is possible if you're wearing a mask all the time. Now, not many people suffer severe effects of this, 
But just to put this in perspective, bearing in mind all the stuff, Patrick, that we've been hearing about mental health uh, and issues with mental health uh, over the last um, period, you know, particularly over the, over the last couple of years, but particularly in the last couple of months with respect to this, some of the more severe symptoms of hypercapnia, unexplained feelings of confusion, abnormal feelings of paranoia or depression, abnormal muscle twitching, irregular heartbeat, uh, seizures, panic attacks, passing out, but it's the it's the first three that really uh, grab me. Un, unexplained feelings of confusion, abnormal feelings of paranoia or depression, ab, uh, and so on. That, in the, the context of the lockdown and the effect that the lockdown has had on people's mental health, when they're under pressure already, we now force them to wear masks, put them at risk of, of uh, excess breathing, breathing in excess CO2, and these are the types of effects that some people may experience as a result. Uh, I would like to see the risk assessments that the BMJ, the government, everybody that's recommending widespread use of masks have done. And that's not to say anything about the fact that these masks become uh, growth uh, areas for bacteria themselves and so on. So you're breathing in your own bacteria again. I think this is an attack on, you have to look at this, it, in a way, Mike, it's an attack on public health. This is an attack on public health, but it's also an attack, psychological attack. Mm. I mean, th that doesn't even address the, you, you mentioned all those bullet points, Mike, about the effects. It doesn't even address the psychological impact of living in a community or living in a society where everybody is always wearing a mask and no one can actually see each other. Again, it's uh, denying human contact with people, uh, facial contact, just normal human relations. They're already doing that with, quote, social distancing, but now adding this with masks. And why is this coming, this, this drive to wear masks? Why is this coming after the virus uh, has, uh, has no, basically disting, uh, extinguished itself? Uh, it already peaked. Well, we'll talk about the peak later. Well, but I mean, you mentioned social distancing, so let's get straight on. Well, social distancing is, is back now uh, with a vengeance. And again, as we're supposed to be easing the lockdown, you're starting to see all of these heavy social distancing measures coming into play uh, everywhere you go in public. We'll show you some examples of that. Uh, but uh, here's Boris Johnson. And it's, again, it's the mixed messaging uh, that's going on. Boris Johnson urged by senior Tories to relax the two-meter rule within a fortnight to avoid large-scale redundancy. So concern amongst the uh, Blue Rinse Brigade, Mike, uh, that uh, the two-meter rule needs to be adapted because this could be very, very damaging on business. Now, not, not getting rid of the social distancing, but adapting mm. the social distancing. Let's look at uh, what they're saying there, these grandees. Uh, Greg Clark, chairman of the Commons Science Committee, has written to the prime minister asking him to urgently review the rule and consider whether a reduction to 1.5 meters... <laughs> may be possible in light of newly available evidence. What is this newly available evidence and could it be used to say that we could scrap the policy altogether? Mike, we'll show you some of the newly available evidence in a minute, but let's call this the COVID logjam because this social distancing regime is causing a logjam economically. It's not allowing businesses, it's not allowing the economy to recover. And this is exactly what this policy, the effect of this policy is having. Are they, are they aware, are they conscious of the damage that this is doing on the economic, the social, uh, the psychological, and also the relationship between people and government? I think the answer to that question is yes, they are aware. It's, it's just unbelievable, but it goes on. It even gets more interesting. The difference between two meters and 1.5 meters may seem small, but it can be the difference between people being able to go to work and losing their jobs. Technically, there's some truth in here into what businesses can operate and what can't, but the, the, the ridiculousness of this conversation, where this has gotten to, it is, it's beyond embarrassing, mm -hmm. it's beyond a farce, and I, it's, it's amazing how you could, uh, how can we take this seriously? We can't. How can we take this seriously? It's very hard. So let's look at what the experts are saying here. It wasn't long ago that... Uh, this story uh, came into the headlines, Mike. Is there any science behind the two-meter social distancing rule? Government advisor said guidelines on keeping apart were conjured out of nowhere. And so this was Robert uh, Dingwall. He was with uh, NerveTag uh, and said the rule was not 
Uh, it wasn't backed by uh, science and evidence or anything like that. It was literally plucked out of thin air. It was a kind of a rule of thumb that they, they used, and it turned into policy, which is incredible. Let's look at what he actually said here. Uh, again, he's uh, an expert in this field and is tied into SAGE, Mike. He says, well, there is a certain amount of scientific evidence for a one meter distance, which comes out of indoor studies in clinical and experimental settings. So again, this rules out all outdoor areas, any large spaces. They, it shouldn't apply to this social distancing, even if you buy into the social distancing regime. And he goes on to say, there's never been a scientific basis for two meters. It's kind of a rule of thumb, says Robert Dingwall. He says, uh, but it's not like there is a whole kind of rigorous scientific literature uh, that it is founded upon. And he just, to, to nail this point home, he says, I think it would be much harder to get compliance with some of the measures that really do not have uh, an evidence base. I mean, the two meter rule was conjured up out of nowhere. Uh, and, and the other thing, Patrick, was that when, when Brian was investigating this, and we covered this on, on the news program, uh, one of the things that uh, was absolutely clear that there was no assessment of the effect of, for example, of, of air conditioning in a supermarket or in a, 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 a major store, a shopping mall, Research. or even in an aircraft, the recirculation of air and so on. So the, under those circumstances, does social distancing make any sense at all? There's no answer to that. There isn't. And also, as we reported on previous programs, Mike, the uh, CDC coming out and saying that, no, it can't be transferred on surfaces very easily. Mm -hmm. That includes money and other areas. So all that scare mongering that at uh, the beginning of the pandemic mm -hmm. um, was has really kind of washed away in light of real science and real studies. So again, it, this doesn't help the social distancing argument at all. Right. Still, the government are what? Working on February's data, February's assumptions, February's information, and they're still running with policy. Mm -hmm. Not just running with policy, running enthusiastically with the policy. But uh, it's not just uh, Robert Dingwall, Mike, that's saying this. There's others. This is a, a U.S. professor from the University of Southern California. His name's Joel Hay. He's saying there's no scientific proof social distancing prevents, prevents the spread of COVID-19. So there's a number of experts, Mike, who are weighing in on this, okay? And let's just remind people here uh, about infections, hospitalizations. They already peaked in March, as you can see from this graph. Number of deaths per day, April 10th. That was the peak. Ever since then, it's been going down. So clearly the virus is tailing down. There's an argument to be made about how the UK are counting their deaths. Mm -hmm. And certainly that's a valid argument and a challenge to uh, medical officials and the government that basically that the death toll is being amplified and pumped up and basically uh, is not accurate uh, whatsoever. Uh, number of infections per day, well, that looks like it peaked there according to these uh, statistics, Mike, on April the 10th, okay? So, and again, in the US, we could say more or less the same thing. Hospitalizations for COVID-19 peaked on, wow, March the 18th. So that's a long time ago. This is a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So why are the UK and uh, the US specifically still running with the mask narrative, still running with the social distancing narrative, when it's clear that the COVID-19 virus um, is long gone or is basically on its way out and may never come back. There's no guarantee that there's going to be a second wave that everybody's been promising, mm -hmm. which hasn't arrived, so it's probably not going to arrive. Mm -hmm. uh, will there be COVID-19 in the next flu season, next winter? Yeah, it might appear. Is it going to be as big and bad? A lot of experts are saying no. Mm -hmm. So, well, there's more, there's more to this narrative. Let's just a bit of COVID truth. This is also from uh, Carl Friston. He is a top statistician, Mike, uh, and he's a computer modeling expert, okay? He did an interview with Unheard. This is uh, Freddie Sayers here from Unheard, basically saying 80% of the population are likely not even susceptible to COVID-19. That's huge. If you consider what we just showed you in terms of the government pushing this mandatory mask policy, and, and increased social distancing regimes, 14-day mm. quarantines, and the top statisticians, the top doctors in this country, which we showed last week as well, are basically saying that, no, this is not as dangerous or as nearly as lethal. In fact, the lethality puts it statistically within the exact same range as the seasonal flu. So 
So why are we transforming our economy? Why are we transforming society based on something that is not a threat in general to the population mm -hmm. and specifically targets one demographic, which is the elderly over 70, 75 with multiple comorbidities? That is the main risk group for COVID-19. This is where the majority of the deaths have occurred, Mike. Yeah. So why, why are we rearranging society and business and policy and cratering the economy uh, based on this so-called threat? That's the question. Yeah, so keep going. So, and uh, we'll move on. Now, this just came in, Mike, uh, 10 days ago, two weeks ago. After the COVID crisis is over, this is the city of Plymouth. This was sent to me by uh, one of our uh, viewers here. Uh, they've spray painted COVID stencils to keep apart all over town, literally every bit of the pavement around the city of Plymouth has, has got these, plus these colorful stickers. These are more child friendly, uh, but uh, th so these are everywhere basically in town. They just appeared in the last two weeks. Mm. So you didn't see any of this in March during the peak of the COVID crisis or April in the peak of the COVID crisis or the beginning of May when it was tailing off. And here we are in June when it's basically over and they're ramping out all of this signage and have basically spray painted every bit of pavement uh, in the city. Here's another look there. And interestingly, you can see up here in the corner, that's a permanent sign, Mike. These look like metallic signs. They're not designed to go anywhere soon. These aren't temporary signs. But imagine the environment around the city, Mike, where you've got everywhere you turn are these sort of COVID psychological triggers everywhere. And so here's the, a close-up of that sign, COVID-19, keep apart, okay? We've already told you, even the top scientists in the country are saying there's no argument scientific basis for social distancing. And that was back in April. And here they're now rolling out all of these uh, uh, social engineering um, COVID programs here. And this is going into the main shopping center, Mike, at Drake Circus. And now you can see it looks like a giant nightclub. <laughs> They've got barriers around the middle. You can only go in one side, out the other. And you can see you're, you're greeted there with all these instructional um, uh, bollards uh, with instructions about how to uh, be on guard for COVID, et cetera. There's the, uh, you can see the spray painted graffiti is there too. They haven't missed any spots around town. There's a close up of that in one side, of course, out the other. Uh, you have to comply as well because there are security guards, Mike, to make sure that you are not going through the wrong door when you shouldn't be. This has all come in the last week, okay? And on the ground, every 10 feet, every, every few meters, no waiting. You must keep moving. And there's a little clock there, Mike, you can see with a Ghostbusters sign in there. Just for people who don't understand what no waiting means, um, they've made it really child-friendly there. So, and again... This is the safety uh, bollards here and in contactless payments. There you go, promoting the cashless society and uh, avoid groups, they're saying. Keep your distance, wash your hands, avoid shaking hands with people, close contact. You can see that's now verboten as well. So all of this is happening and yet we're seeing stories like this just last week saying one meter is enough. So the, the, the confusion on social distancing in the internal dialogue of this bizarre world of COVID, um, th there's no consensus. They can't even make up their mind whether it's two meters, 1.5, or one meter. But, aside, but, but the key point here, Patrick, which I think you've made extremely well, is that we are supposed to be coming out of lockdown at this stage. The pandemic is supposed to be over or nearly over. Uh, but these, this signage is new. Yes. It's new. It's clearly here to stay. Uh, and so the new normal is being rolled out in front of our eyes. Whether it's needed or not. Whether it's needed or not. Absolutely. And really, people should be asking lots and lots of questions at this point, And we should be challenging MPs to give serious answers to why this is happening. Is this necessary? And on what it, risk is it based on? What is the risk assessment for COVID-19? Where does it compare with something like, say, the seasonal flu? or tuberculosis or something else. Is it really fatal? Is it really deadly? Does it really affect the entire population? Or does it only affect a specific demographic that should be uh, given special treatment and care for? Uh, and the irony here, uh, Patrick, is that the owners of Drake Circus, the shopping center, the owners of all the stores inside that shopping center have bought into this narrative to such a degree that they're effectively committing uh, mass suicide. 
uh, as, as businesses economically. Yeah. Yes, because they are not going to get the footfall through their shops that they require to meet the rent payments. Uh, so the, on, on a medium, even a short term basis, even assuming that they survive uh, the, 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 the last three months of absolute lockdown, um, they are they are going to go out of business very very quickly. There's yeah. a, there is no possibility that they can act. I mean, Primark, for example, recently said that they have two billion pounds worth of stock sitting in warehouses waiting to be sold. On this on the basis of of two meters uh, social distancing, or even on the basis of one meter social social distancing, how can they get the footfall through their store to shift two billion pounds worth of back stock? It's not possible. And they're already being, 90% of the businesses are already being stigmatized as non-essential businesses. They've already been labeled as non-essential. So they're already creating this tiered system within society and within business. And the, the, the ridiculousness of all of this, Mike, and everything that you just described, and I'll, I'll finish here, is that when you go outside of these retail environments, outside of these corporate sanctuaries, Mike, Nobody cares about social distancing. Mm -hmm. People laugh at the, what's on the pavement. They're out uh, behaving as normal, mixing and mingling as normal, pretty much in a lot of places all over the country, all over the world, in fact. But it's only when you go into official buildings or into corporate territory uh, that this re or schools or institutions that this new regime comes into mm -hmm. effect. But, so clearly the public are not really buying it or the, the, the fear is not there. Otherwise, we wouldn't have seen uh, tens of thousands of people out on the street protesting mm. just this week uh, in the UK and maybe millions in the United States. So do they really believe in the threat of COVID and the need to observe social distancing? I don't think so. No, absolutely not. Okay, if you like what the UK Column does and you would like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community. Uh, your support, much needed, much appreciated. Uh, but Patrick, let's come on to uh, the subject you were just uh, introducing there. Uh, controversial perhaps, but George Floyd. Yes, George Floyd. Uh, so the, the memorial service uh, has taken place over the last uh, couple of days, Mike, and that's all around the country. And there's a, a spray paint image of him. I believe this is in the city of Houston. Uh, but you'll see these all over walls, all over the country. So this has become a kind of a national event. Here's some other uh, examples of some of the different George uh, Floyd murals that are appearing. So he's been kind of a, become a, um, a phenomenon, as, as it were, over the last uh, two weeks. And so for people who aren't familiar with the story, uh, George Floyd uh, died at the hands of uh, the Minneapolis Police Department uh, two weeks ago, Monday. Uh, and so the officer, uh, main officer, was charged with murder, a second-degree murder. Uh, but this kicked off a uh, massive uh, outrage and protest, public protests uh, against the police department initially in Minneapolis, and then it, it cascaded nationwide. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about some of the reasons for that. But uh, there's the uh, scene there. I believe this is from one of the funeral uh, scenes here uh, for George Floyd. So, uh, and a, here's a comment here, which I'll throw in. This is from a former NYPD uh, a police officer and also radio host, uh, John Cudillo. He's saying, so thousands can attend George Floyd's funeral, but you can't uh, attend your relatives. Kind of making an important point here, Mike, and again, this just talks to what we said before, is where are all the restrictions? Is, is it all been lifted because of this? It does seem like that this is more about politics mm -hmm. uh, than it is about um, a lot of things. And so there is, of course, an issue here with regards to police brutality. That's a serious issue, especially in the United States, uh, a long running issue that's been given a lot of airtime uh, over many decades. And also uh, the racial discrimination uh, issue as well, the uh, accusations of systematic racism in the United States. So this has been a well-tread territory in terms of politics and analysis. We won't get into that very much. There's plenty of talk about that right now in every single media outlet uh, around the world. But what's interesting, what I'm looking at this interesting, Mike, is how and why uh, did this explode in the way that it did uh, in, in, in so, so massively um, and so quickly? Yeah, because there have been other instances of, of uh, police uh, killing black uh, people of 
various age, ages in various cities in the United States. And there was perhaps some localized trouble, but this is the first time that it's really gone global in the way that it has. Yeah, and also if you look at uh, Google Trends, for instance, um, you know, w look at Black Lives Matter, BLM, when, when was it really trending? right before elections, mm -hmm. so 2016 before the election, and of course it's really spiked now if you look at some of the uh, analytics on that. The other thing is that, yes, it's an election year, but also this is coming on the back of lockdown. So people have been locked up for three months, uh, and the kids are not in school. There's a large percentage of, of protesters and demonstrators are young kids uh, under the age of 18, uh, and they're going out on these protests. The parents are you know, endorsing it, in some cases going with them. Mm -hmm. Normally they would be in school now, doing exams, preparing for the end of year, and so forth. So that's one reason. The other reason is a lot of people that are unemployed because of lockdown. Mm -hmm. So lockdown and the COVID-19 crisis has created the perfect storm uh, for this to really take off in a, in a massive way. And there's also, Mike, people have been kind of, I, I think, dehumanized as well through the lockdown process desperate to express themselves politically uh, because they've been pretty much muted and kept down for three months. And now this opportunity came and, and people rushed for it, okay? Especially the political left saw this as a great opportunity to gain some ground. And certainly that's uh, what's what's been happening as well. Yeah. Yeah, so in the UK then, I mean, it, it, the protests have come to the UK as well. Uh, and uh, well, and alongside the uh, the protests, uh, actually quite a lot of violence uh, seems to have come to the UK as well. This, uh, could, this could have been a Remain rally as well, Mike, could have doubled as a Remain rally. Uh, well, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but uh, as uh, some people are saying, attacks on the on journalism, on journalists uh, happening as well. By uh, the crowd, not by the, by the crowd, police. Not by the police, yes. absolutely. In the UK. Uh, so yeah. this is Matthew, yes, in the UK, this is Matthew Thompson saying the protest is similar, simmering on the brink on Twitter. Uh, after a period of calm, it almost escalates as journalists are hounded away from Downing Street with chants of F the Daily Mail. So uh, the Daily Mail absolutely uh, getting it uh, in the neck here uh, with some pretty abusive comments, apparently. Uh, well, uh, while I don't agree with that type of uh, thing, um, it's hardly surprising, is it? Because the Daily Mail, of course, has been at the centre of a lot of the most inf uh, inflammatory headlines over the last three, four months, in fact, over the last several years, but particularly over the last three, four months. But in the meantime, uh, we have uh, the police uh, in London taking the knee with Black Lives Matter protesters. Uh, so this is uh, the Evening Standard reporting that, also Metro reporting it, London police take the knee with Black Lives Matter protesters. Uh, and uh, of course, I've, I mean, I don't know about you, Patrick, but I find, find this a little unpleasant, actually, because the guy, this is how the guy was killed, with somebody kneeling on his neck, on their knee. Good point. And, and so, you know, this, this seems to be, this gesture seems to have been, I don't know which PR firm is behind this idea, but we've, we're seeing uh, UK Fire Brigade doing this, in staged photographs and so on. Uh, this seem, there seems to be something ritualistic about this, and I think it's quite unpleasant celebrating death perhaps but as well as that of course uh, the other thing that perhaps resonates with people a little bit uh, just coming out of a, a respiratory pandemic in inverted commas it, of course this guy died through a lack of breath and so breath is a big feature of this as well there's a lot of very deep psychology going on around this whole protest uh, and i think uh, people need to be looking at it very, very closely. The, the origins, just quickly, the origins of taking the knee uh, was made popular by uh, Colin Kaepernick. He's a, a United States professional athlete in the uh, NFL National Football League. And so during the national anthem at the beginning of each game, when uh, players and fans would stand up to the national anthem in the US, uh, Colin Kaepernick did a protest, a symbolic protest. He would get down and take, so-called take the knee. In other words, saying he's not gonna participate uh, in the national anthem uh, due to the uh, unfair treatment of uh, African Americans at the hands of police in the United States. So that, that's where that started. So this is really an American uh, bit of uh, political symbology uh, that has now made its way um, to the UK. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about this protest is everyone's irate and they're lashing out at police, but was there uh, any event that happened in Britain uh, where there was racial abuse at the hands of the police with 
Well, this, this is an American event that's just been reappropriated to the UK. Yes. It's probably the easiest reappropriation because of the language uh, as well. And, and people share media internationally now. A lot of people in Britain, Australia, New Zealand, they're as much engaged in American politics, Mike, um, in terms of the time they spend watching it, talking about it, than they are in their own local politics yes. in some cases. So this is a really interesting phenomenon. So, But it, it's kind of, what's, what's amazing about this, the last thing I'll say, is the political left in Britain um, have been on a massive losing streak um, in the last couple of years. I mean, uh, Jeremy Corbyn's movement collapsed, Brexit came, the Remain campaign lost, uh, Boris won by a huge mandate in the last mm -hmm. general election. So, and then they appoint uh, a Blairite as head of the Labour Party. So there's really nothing exciting or really going on in terms of the left in the UK. And so while everyone's on lockdown, there's an opportunity that happens in America. They say, yes, we'll have some of that. Let's protest about that uh, in the UK. And let's, you know, solidarity with our US brothers and sisters. But what's it really going to do in the long run besides everyone going out and expressing their virtue on this issue. Is it going to have any political impact? What objectives will they uh, achieve through this? Or is it just basically a show of, of solidarity and then you know, one day protesting, two days spray painting on statues, and then everybody goes home? Uh, I, think, I think it's quite a bit of it is to do is, is to broaden the divide between the general public and the police once again. That's, that's part of it as well, is to, to demonize the police as broadly as possible uh, and vice versa. In fact, with to demonize the public with the police. I think uh, there, there are gonna be longer term consequences to this. Huge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But in the meantime, another area where uh, race is being brought in, hate, crime, all this sort of stuff being brought in uh, is the issue of uh, the coronavirus infodemic, uh, the uh, misinformation alleged uh, about coronavirus on social media. So this is hashtag will to act. Social media giants claim to be taking the coronavirus infodemic seriously. Our latest report produced with Restless Development uh, tests these claims and we'll have a look at this in a second. But who's behind this? Uh, well, it is the Center for Countering Digital Hate. I'm not quite sure what coronavirus misinformation has to do with digital hate, but apparently this is now considered a hate crime. Um, so what are they saying in the report? Uh, they're saying that 649 posts were considered to be misinformation. I'm not quite sure uh, on what, you know, what basis they've set themselves up to make that consideration. But anyway, this is the action that uh, they say that the social media companies did, that 6.3% of those 649 posts were removed. The 2% of the accounts that were behind those posts were terminated by the social media companies and that 1% of them flagged were flagged but remained online. So they're deeply concerned that the social media companies not doing enough to stifle free speech on this uh, in this uh, subject, Patrick, uh, and uh, more needs to be done. But it's a hate issue. It's a hate issue. I, 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 this is very disturbing because it's basically conflating two separate things that shouldn't be under the same roof. Um, I've had some personal uh, run-ins with Facebook recently. I'll just give you uh, one example. Besides the fact that uh, they normally block my account from sharing content uh, on average every 30, or every 30 days, which is basically a rolling censorship ban uh, that's been placed on, on my account for a couple of years now. So the, but they're censoring the science, Mike. We're always told that the government is being guided by the science on COVID-19. So if the rallying cry, Mike, as you, as you pointed out with the Center for Digital Hate, is misinformation about COVID-19, then we should be looking at the science. We should be looking at the top immunologists, the top virologists. So I've just been flagged here, for example, uh, this just popped up on my phone yesterday. Your post goes against our community standards on misinformation that could cause physical harm. That's a serious accusation right there. So they're saying my post could cause physical harm, and it violates community standards, okay? And the subject is coronavirus. So what I was, what I was posting was this. This is an interview with Henrik Strait. He is one of the top virologists in Europe, maybe in the world, okay? And he gave an interview with Freddie Serre from Unheard, and we showed that previous interview in the show, okay? And the headline is, leading German virologist said, COVID-19 is less deadly than we thought. 
So I didn't come up with any original commentary. Really, here is, is just a re-syndication of an interview that the professor from Germany did with Unheard. Okay. So for this, I have been threatened with another ban. I don't know how many different violations uh, I've been accused of and what that means for my ability to use that social media platform. But they're targeting real science. They're saying that real science is misinformation, not giving you any explanation as to why it's violated community standards or how this could be putting people at physical risk. That's a serious accusation in its own. Um, they're just accusing you of it and then putting the ban or issuing the uh, violation warning. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, so there's the, ar so there's the, article, the article there, but yeah. it's, it's censoring the science. Is, is what is what Facebook is doing, Mike? So. Oh, okay. Well, let's let's move on then to the New York Times. This is uh, uh, Tom Cotton. Now we're going to meet Tom Cotton again in a second. But Tom C Cotton, the Republican senator, uh, and uh, the New York Times uh, hosted an op-ed, an opinion piece from him, uh, saying, "Send in the troops. Uh, the nation must restore order. The military stands ready." Uh, well, this got quite uh, a response from other New York Times journalists. So this is Kyle Buchanan here saying. Uh, running this puts black New York Times staff in danger and it's effing dumb as so on. Uh, I uh, stand with my colleagues. Um, and so it, there really was a response to this, Patrick. Top then, journalist there, Mike. Absolutely, a top journalist. And, and so then the New York, the, the News Guild in New York, which is a uh, journalist union uh, work in, for journalists working in the city, uh, issued a statement saying, Cotton calls to mobilize the military to detain and subdue Americans protesting racism and police brutality. His message undermines the journalistic work of our members, puts, out black, puts our black staff members in danger, promotes hate, and is likely to encourage further violence. Uh, our ability to cover this moment of history depends on values the paper has long espoused, a commitment to balanced and factual report, uh, and our promise to leaders that we will bring them unbiased news. So this is pretty unprecedented. No, this is not only unprecedented, but everything you read there, Mike, his complaint is complete nonsense. Uh, nonsense. I was going to use a British colloquial yeah. term that starts with B yes. uh, and ends with CKS. But uh, so this journalist, what, what, he's say, what he's trying to say, Mike, is that Tom Cotton's op-ed, and I'm no fan of Tom Co no, Senator no, Tom no, Cotton. No. <laughs> He's a total warmonger. He's a rabid neocon. Definitely someone I would not want to have over for a barbecue, Mike. But but the, the, what Tom Cotton wrote in the New York Times as an op-ed was was fa fairly anodyne, Mike. There was nothing really uh, that that popped out in there that was very shocking. He was basically uh, reiterating what U.S. policy is, and the New York Times journalist got it all wrong. He's saying that it's it's putting the military on the streets and saying that the military will be targeting black people, which is an unbelievable statement, okay? The U.S. National Guard is normally deployed not by the federal government, but by state governors. And all of the, Demo most of the democratic states where there's been protests have already deployed National Guard troops on the streets, including California, the most liberal state in the union, but also uh, in other places as well. Uh, so even in, in Minnesota, Mike, mm -hmm. the National Guard, there's a Democratic government and a Democratic mayor of Minneapolis. They've deployed the National Guard. That's within their purview. It has been uh, many times in history. The military has been deployed to put down, basically when, when there's rioting and looting and people's lives are in danger and, and whole business zones and commercial districts are in danger of getting torched, okay, and people are getting robbed, we have seen videos, Mike, of people, uh, you can go online on Twitter and find these on YouTube, people being pulled out of their cars and beaten by randomly by the mob. And if you've ever had the displeasure of being in the middle of riots, Mike, I, or protests that have gone awry, I have been in a few, so I'm speaking from experience. I have seen some of these things happen, and they're not pleasant, okay? Mm -hmm. But this is normal procedure. The, the, the mob set fire to a guard station, the Secret Service guard station, next to the White House. Next, Now, you know how paranoid Americans are about their national security, mm -hmm. and they have all of uh, these contingencies in place. When the White House gets attacked and the building uh, next to it uh, is attempted to be set on fire as well, and people are firing Roman candles into the White House lawn, that becomes a national security issue. So the, 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 the military, the Secret Service, have to invoke continuity of government at that point, COG procedures, which means a president is then moved away from the White House, 
sent to a secure facility so that the business of the country uh, and the president's duties can remain uh, in, in process and without any interruption. That's normal continuity of government. That's not a military takeover. That's just procedure. The military is on standby in Washington, D.C. to do this for any president, including Barack Obama, George Bush, Bill Clinton, and the list goes on and on. So there's nothing unusual about what Tom Cotton says. He's saying, and as a last resort, if the National Guard troops, which are from each state, like a state militia, okay, but under the guise of the Pentagon, uh, if that doesn't work or isn't effective, then to deploy active service military uh, in to help uh, quell the situation is what he was saying. And he's saying, we help, I hope it doesn't come to that, but this is what the president should be prepared to do in that instance. And who's going to disagree with that? Whether you're a Democratic uh, administration or Republican administration, the United States government needs to have continuity of government. It's just a fact. And anybody that's crying foul over this is... is really unbelievable. Well, you only disagree with it whenever you're in opposition, right? When you're an opposition political party. But right. speaking of Tom Cotton, we'll come up back to him in a second. He's, as you say, neocon, war hawk. Uh, things getting quite uh, tense, shall we say, with Russia and China. Now, we intended to cover this on Wednesday, but ran out of time. We're out of time again today, but we're going to do this because it is important. Uh, so the Russians getting really, really upset about the level of what they're describing as NATO aggression. At the moment, this is uh, Colonel General Sergei uh, Rudskoy, who's the chief of the main operational director of the Russian general staff. He was giving a brief briefing earlier this week, uh, and uh, he alleged, he charged that NATO military activities around Russia's borders have been escalating despite the, pan the, the pandemic, uh, and that Russia uh, offer has been offering to work out uh, some kind of way to, to cool this down, but NATO isn't isn't buying it. Uh, so uh, the U.S. Uh, sending B-1B bombers into very very close to Russia uh, and uh, very close to Russia's borders. One in April, five in May, uh, and two of the borders, uh, two of the bombers flying over the Black Sea, uh, having uh, passed through Ukrainian airspace. Uh, so this is what he had to say. Uh, he said that during these flights, U.S. planes were approaching the border of the Kal uh, Kaliningrad region at a distance up, this is a bad translation perhaps, this is the Russian translation, a distance of up to 10 kilometers. I think he means as close as 10 kilometers, yeah. right? And he went on to say, we regard such act actions as provocative, despite the fact the U.S. side has been has notified these ships in the Barents Sea that the short, in, in the shortest possible time. So what they were doing was, was uh, te uh, targeting ships in the Barents Sea. The U it was a US-based uh, NATO uh, exercise with ships in the Barents Sea, uh, very, very close to Russia and Russia getting very upset about it. We regard such flights as contrary to the signed agreements uh, on preventing incidents in Syrian airspace. So they were also targeting uh, Syrian airspace as well. So this was... Uh, was very unpleasant for the Russians. Uh, and uh, well, the Americans then, ha ha having the Russians having made those statements, the American side actually uh, made this uh, B-1B exercise, the most recent one, uh, public through Air Force Times. There's a statement by the Air Force, uh, USAF B-1B Lancers practiced anti-ship missile strikes in Black Sea. This was going on. For, for weeks and months now. And as I say, the Russians getting particularly uptight about it, as you would expect. In the meantime, the pressure building on China as well. So first of all, we had Boris Johnson uh, on Tuesday, I think it was, uh, on the Hong Kong crisis. We will meet our obligations, not walk away. So while we're running a quarantine for everybody in the UK that's coming into the UK, a two-week quarantine, apparently that's not going to put off uh, anybody from Hong Kong that wants to get a British visa and perhaps leave the country. Uh, but uh, Boris, uh, perhaps under quite a lot of pressure to rethink his relationship with respect to China, Huawei, we'll come on to that in a second, but he's making these statements about, uh, about Hong Kong. And then they had Tom Cotton. Uh, Tom Cotton was giving evidence to the 5G subcommittee of the Defence Committee uh, this week. He's been very busy lately. Very, very busy, yes. Uh, and this is what he had to say. To deploy Huawei would be as if we had relied on, an advers on adversarial nations in the Cold War to build our submarines or build our tanks. 
It's just not something that we would have ever considered. So there is a, a lot of pressure building from the US side, but not just from the US side, even within the UK as well. The, the Defence Select Committee has been absolutely against any Chinese involvement in any UK infrastructure for quite some time, but particularly Huawei. Um, and uh, so they were quite happy to have Tom, Com uh, Tom Cotton on uh, as part of their meeting to give evidence. Um, but I thought that was a fascinating statement, Patrick. Uh, 5G is equivalent to submarines and tanks, right? Now, submarines and tanks, correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick, but I'm not aware that submarines or tanks have any civilian application, right? But the 5G networks that are being built out without any, uh, without any uh, precautionary principle at all uh, are supposedly for civilian use for our mobile phones and uh, our internet access and things like this. No, uh, what we're actually seeing being deployed in the UK is a military uh, infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, surveillance infrastructure, but a military infrastructure uh, and the uh, select committee extremely concerned that, that because it is a military and surveillance infrastructure that it can be subverted by uh, the Chinese. But I would ask the question, is the concern about Huawei to do with the Chinese government uh, snooping on our communications? Because after all, we're largely carrying Chinese made equipment uh, already. So if the Chinese wanted to do that, they're quite capable of doing it already. Uh, or is it the fact that if uh, you em employ a, a Huawei router rather than a Cisco or a Juniper networks or some of these other types of equipment, is it that we can't snoop on the data that's passing through the Huawei gear? Is that is that more of the problem? I'm not sure. I'm just asking the question. I think that's a big part of it. Uh, absolutely. But to keep uh, to keep the pressure on China, then, of course, we had Richard Dearlove uh, saying this. I don't think that the pandemic started as an accident. It raises the issue. If China were ever, ever were to admit responsibility, does it pay reparations? I think it will make every country in the world rethink how it treats its relationship with China. There's a lot of, if we, well, we'll come on to it in a second. There's a lot of stress building up between the West and Russia and China at the moment. So, so uh, by the way, Richard Dearlove here. And so anybody that was insinuating uh, that the uh, coronavirus uh, came from a lab or was, was cooked up in a lab just a few months ago was derided as a conspiracy theorist, Mike, so this is the former head of MI6, basically letting that cat out of the bag. Right. How much truth is there to that? Or is this positioning? Is this brigsmanship? Uh, 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 good question. So all this building up between Russia and China and the West, uh, this comes onto the issue of are we at war or not? And so let's just bring uh, this in, uh, because this is uh, 13th, uh, 13th Brigade. Uh, which has just been set up. I think I've I think I've got that slightly wrong. 13th Signals Regiment, I should say. So they've uh, look this just launched by the Ministry of Defence. 13th Signal Re Regiment, a dedicated cyber regiment. Uh, it's was stood up on Monday uh, this week at a ceremony at Blandford, uh, which is the home of the Royal Signals. And this is all about cyber. So let's have a look at what uh, uh, General Mark Carlton Smith had to say about this. Uh, th sorry. Uh, that it's all about uh, the British military being cyber fit. Uh, now, of course, that's not Mark Carlton Smith that's on screen there at the moment, uh, but he absolutely reminds us very much of uh, Lord Flashheart from Blackadder. Uh, and, and this is why, uh, just have a listen to this. We've shown this before, but I just want to remind everybody uh, what he said uh, a couple of years ago on the issue of hybrid warfare. Systematically exploiting instead that hybrid space that exists between those two increasingly redundant states of peace and war, artificial and binary characterizations of a strategic context that no longer exists today, but which still drives much of our policy and legal definition and their associated frameworks. So what he's basically saying there, Patrick, is there is we are in a world where there is no difference between peace and war. Binary, it's out the way. We're on a spectrum uh, where there is no off switch for warfare anymore. And and what I'm arguing here, what I'm suggesting is that this is a pretty dangerous position we're building ourselves into, where we're taking on 
uh, significant nations like Russia and China in the way that we are. We're building up the infrastructure, 77 Brigade, now 13th Signals. We've got all this fusion doctrine, which is being built up at the moment. And here we've got Lord Flashheart basically telling us uh, that uh, we're in a state of perpetual war. Um, and uh, put this together with the Black Lives Matter protests, with the pandemic, uh, where do you see this going in the next year or two? There is an uncanny resemblance, by the way, between uh, General Carlton Smith, who does look a lot like Lord Flashheart, mm. so you're very lucky there with that one, Mike. But uh, you know, where is this going? It's what you said, Mike. It's a continuous warfare, the war that never ends. You can never relax. You can never have respite. There's always a conflict around the corner. The cyber war is also going on behind the scenes. The censorship, the DDoS attacks, the hacking, the accusations of hacking, the accusations of attacking the internet for, by China. This, just this week, China and Iranian hackers apparently have targeted U.S. Uh, political systems. We just saw a headline just last night. I mean, it just never ends. And the whole basis of the ramp up of this, Mike, has been completely debunked already, which was Russiagate. It didn't happen in any way, shape, or form, despite all the all the hype and everything that was built on top of that. Yeah. So this, all this, is just built on top of that, yes. and that was fake. That was false. So they're building everything on top of a false premise. And when you, when there's permanent war, Mike, who loses? the people lose. The people get caught in the crossfire. In this case, it will be the digital cyber crossfire. It will be in our day-to-day -day lives. It will be through psychological uh, uh, triggering through media uh, by government, etc. Just non a non-stop uh, attack on, on people's minds. Absolutely. Well, look, we've got to leave it there. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be back at the same time, 1 p.m. on Monday, as usual. Um, have a good weekend, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.